Hello, Iceland. I am loving it here. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, as Berg said, my name is Catherine Matice. I'm the founder and CEO of Civility Partners. I want to tell you a little bit about my story and how I came to be an expert in the very niche topic of workplace bullying. I was a director of HR working for a small company. Another director, not my boss, another director, my peer, was a bully. Have you worked with a bully before? I saw a lot of you raise your hands with the bad bosses. Now we're going to talk about worse bosses. <laughs> So I spent a lot of time managing this situation. As HR, I was getting a lot of complaints, uh, spent a lot of time talking to the president about solving this problem. I personally felt bullied. So I really witnessed firsthand the damage that being bullied can cause an individual. And I witnessed firsthand the damage that it causes an organization. Now in the United States where I live, workplace bullying is perfectly lawful. So I always like to joke, all you have to do is bully everyone or harass everyone and you're well within your legal rights to do that. I understand here in, in Iceland and in the Nordic countries, that's not the case. Um, so while I was working at that organization, I decided to get my master's degree in human communication. My very first class, the very first semester, was called the dark side of communication. And that class was about all things dark. We learned about stalking and domestic violence and sibling rivalry. And of course, I needed a topic, something dark. And I decided to write a paper on this person that I worked with. Turns out there's 40 years of academic research from around the world on the topic of workplace bullying. And I was fascinated. So every class after that was on workplace bullying. My thesis was on workplace bullying. I dedicated it to the post-it Nazi, which is what we called the bully at my work. Uh, and here I am 15 years later, still focused on solving workplace bullying. Uh, so I've, I've had the pleasure of serving a lot of uh, cool industries. I was just tapped to write Navigating Toxic Work Environments for Dummies. Do you have the Four Dummies um, series here in Iceland? Yes, no? <laughs> so, kind of interesting. Anyway, just real quick on the things that we do so you understand my expertise. Uh, Civility Partners does four things. We do workforce surveys, so we often get called in when there is a toxic work environment, uh, and we do a survey to understand what's happening then we take that data and help the organization craft a plan and often implement that plan to turn the culture around. We also do lots and lots of training, of course, and we specialize in coaching leaders who bully. And they can turn around, and I'm gonna talk about that today. So let's talk about the behavior spectrum. I think as HR, we often get focused on kind of buckets of behavior, right? We, we have the compliant or non-compliant, we have harassment, which is unlawful, versus something like gossip. You know, we don't have policies or laws against gossip, but I think we miss the boat if we don't start there. So civility is any behavior that shows value. You value somebody. You wait until they are finished speaking. You accidentally bump into someone, you apologize. Incivility causes harm. Incivility are behaviors that show we don't value someone. You interrupt them. You accidentally bump into somebody, you don't apologize. So I am really focused on creating environments where the organization is focused on this type of behavior that's at this end of the spectrum. Because there's tons of research, for example, that the more incivility there is, or the more conflict there is, the more normalized that bad behavior becomes. And then it evolves over time into abusive conduct, workplace bullying, mobbing is another word for that, that behavior. And mobbing or workplace bullying or abusive conduct, whatever you want to call it, that is the overarching phrase for any behavior that's abusive. Harassment, which of course is based on a protected characteristic, harassment is a subcategory. So again, the only difference between bullying and harassment is who you aim it at. If I bully all of you, that's 
perfectly fine. If I harass you or bully you because of your race, religion, or other protected characteristic, then that's unlawful. So we have to think bigger. We have to think about these behaviors and how they all work together. On the far end of the spectrum is workplace violence, another category of behavior we tend to really separate out. Well, I can tell you, for example, some individuals that I coached are absolutely engaging in workplace violence. They're not punching anybody, but they're doing things like rising up out of their desk and leaning over it and glaring at someone in the face with their vein popping out of their forehead and their aggressive body language and going, that's stupid. That's workplace violence. The person at the other end is afraid. So we have to stop being so focused on these categories. Yes, we have to as HR because there's law, but also in reality, the law doesn't define these behaviors in reality. It's not how they work. So according to SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management, they did a global study and they found that 75% of people never report being harassed at work. Why is that? What are they afraid of? Retaliation. I heard someone say it. I thought you'd all say it at one time. Retaliation. That is correct. Why are they afraid of retaliation? We could say, well, it's them, right? They're living in fear of retaliation. There's examples of retaliation in the news. But I would suggest that you start asking yourself, why in our organization are people afraid of retaliation? What's going on in this organization or not going on in this organization that causes people to think to themselves, I'm not going to report this because I fear retaliation. What messages does your organization send through its behavior that would create a fear of retaliation? The, ret the fear of retaliation falls on you, the employer. So every time we go into an organization, we look at culture through these three facets. And these facets need to be in synergy. So individual behavior. So for example, we could say the culture in my organization is fun and innovative. But if I go to work every day and my manager isn't fun and innovative, then that's not the culture for me, right? So our individual behavior matters. The organization's behavior matters. And of course, leadership matters. So for example, when we do surveys, and we're trying to figure out where are the problems, we often find that people don't feel like they get enough feedback. They don't actually know how to get promoted or how to get to the next level. That's because the organization's processes are broken, right? So people's behavior is going to be dependent on the organization's behavior. Does the organization tolerate bad behavior? Does your website say that your core values include inclusivity and respect and collaboration? Meanwhile, you have a high producer at the top who treats everybody like, you know what? The organization is saying, that's not actually our core value. And then leaders have to be focused on holding people accountable to the right behavior. They have to be communicating about the kind of culture they want. So I'm going to give you five steps for turning around a toxic environment. They're going to sound easy because I'm going to give them to you in 20 minutes. They, well, of course, culture change is not easy. Um, we, if we break culture change down into little pieces, it can be easier anyway. So step number one, there's tons of research out there describing risk factors. So let's start with prevention. So for example, an organization that's lacking diversity, maybe you have one, uh, most of your workers are 20 and 22, the research shows that there's more likely to be harassment when somebody older 
comes into that organization. If you have a bureaucratic organization, so when there's a lot of rules and regulations and red tape to get things done, it makes it easy to hide if you're a bully, and it makes it hard to report if you're a target. So look at these sorts of things. Is, are you in a high stress environment? Um, do you, you know, is there a lack of training on how we're supposed to be treating each other? So start with this list and start understanding where are we at risk for facilitating bad behavior because the, the bully or the bad actor is not the problem. They're functioning inside your organization. So your organization has to be set up to address that behavior. So kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about investigations and compliance and what's lawful and not lawful, let's lean on surveys more. If somebody files a harassment complaint, there's an investigation. It's very focused on the facts. Was this behavior unlawful? And that's, of course, important. But also, what's happening in our organization that allowed this scenario to occur? So we tend to really villainize or go after like the specific person and situation. But again, this is happening in your organization. What role did your organization play? And that's where assessments or workforce surveys come in. Then you can understand what's happening in the organization that essentially facilitated or allowed this behavior to happen. So if you're doing an investigation, you should also be doing a workforce survey. Once you, oh, well, so for example, these are the types of questions that we're asking in our surveys. So we're trying to understand if people feel psychologically safe. Our survey looks at engagement, job satisfaction, inclusivity, internal communication processes. And we love to do interviews if we can. The interviews uh, allow us to get the kind of the juicy details to help us understand why people rated a certain question as a four. Once we have the data, then we develop action, an action plan with an action team. So we don't go into the C-suite and spend two days off site figuring out what to do with that data. We collect people from the organization, from all levels, all departments, all shapes and sizes. Uh, we usually try to get around eight people on this action team, and we work with the action team to create a plan for change. Because when we're going into an environment where there's been harassment or bullying or where people consider it toxic, there's obviously a lot of missing trust between the leaders in the organization. So the leaders aren't the ones who can make this plan. There is a leader on the team, but the team is the ones creating the plan and helping us implement it. So just to give you an example of what some of this kind of stuff that's on the plan looks like, um, often we're doing manager training on proactively building a positive work environment. Have you ever told your managers that they're required to proactively maintain a positive work environment? I find that generally it's sort of unsaid, which they're supposed to create a positive work environment. But if they're not focusing on it and they don't know how, and they haven't been told that's what they're supposed to do, then they're not doing it. On the organizational side, we often are turning core values into core competencies. So we're measuring people on their ability to live the core values that are on your organization's website, holding them accountable. Um, be careful who your organizational champions are. If you're promoting or you know, celebrating people because they get great results, but they bully on their way there, then what message are you sending? And of course, leadership. Lots of coaching with the leadership team about being transparent, holding people accountable. So just to give you an example of uh, a case study, this was, I can tell you it's on our website, UC Berkeley is, a, of course, a big prestigious university in California. Um, their IT department at the height of the Me Too movement in the States, um, they had some women, five, came forth publicly and were very vocal about the way they'd been treated. 
So we did a workforce survey. It turned out that 30% of people in that organization in the IT department at UC Berkeley, 30% of people had witnessed harassment or bullying. It's a lot of people. Five women came forward, but when you do the survey, there's a whole lot more. So we did our survey. We put together our action team. The, there were more objectives on our strategic plan. Here are three of them, just as an example. And of course, they always fit, the action items always fit into these three facets. So we did do manager training on proactively creating a positive environment. We did company-wide training on being an upstander. So what do you do if you're an individual contributor and you witness gossip or harassment or anything in between? Do your individual contributors understand that they have the right to step up and protect their culture? Often bystanders, as a lot of us call them, um, assume it's not my business. That's between them. I'm going to stay out of it. No, no, no. They're responsible for the culture too. So they absolutely need to step in. Um, we did a lot of work with leadership so that they could rebuild the trust that they had lost. Um, you know, the, the CIO or CEO of the organization was going around and having coffee with people, the directors who never, ever interacted with people right below, you know, they interacted with people right below them, but never the other people down below that. So they were going around and making sure they were talking and getting to know people in their organization and department. Um, and then we created a core competency, competency matrix tied to their core values, and I'm going to give you an example of that. So that's my fourth step. You can absolutely hold people accountable to good behavior by turning your core values into core competencies. Just to give you an example, we worked with a chili hot dog chain in Southern California. Um, they already had a pretty good culture, but they wanted to solidify it. So these were the three core values they came up with. And here's an example of turning that core value of fun into a core competency. So now, if I'm a manager at this chili hot dog chain, and I can see that somebody's a bully, or makes fun of another employee, or gossips about them, I can hold them accountable to that, because I can see, according to this competency, that you're not being fun. <laughs> you're bullying. Um, and so you can absolutely use this as a tool so that your managers have something kind of tangible to be able to talk to an employee who's acting out. Um, if you email me, I will send you an example of this competency matrix. We've taken several words like inclusiveness, communication, uh, and turned them into competencies and really broken down in these three kind of it weighs whether or not somebody's actually engaging in that behavior. Last, I'm going to talk to you about addressing the bully specifically. So, of course, everybody needs training. One thing we find in our organizations and everywhere, I am totally unaware of, except for the companies that we've been in, companies that actually provide manager training on how a manager should day in and day out Focus on creating a positive work environment. How does a manager, other than their own ability to build trust, what can a manager be doing with their teams all the time, regularly and consistently, to proactively build an environment that doesn't tolerate bad behavior? I don't see a lot of that type of training. We do it, but I don't, I, it's so important and it's so missing. Um, everybody needs training on being an upstander. What do you do when you witness bad behavior? You don't walk away. And as HR, I know that you probably feel like a lot of times people harbor things, and then like three years later, they're in your office telling you that somebody's harassing. Or you have a manager who's never held someone accountable to good behavior, and now they come in and say, can we fire that person? What can we do? And you're like, well, what have you been doing the last three years? I don't know. So let's talk about leaders who bully. The assumptions is they, they intend to, they like it, 
They're focused on harm that they can't change. Not true. The reality is, I've been coaching these individuals for the last 12 years. The reality is their intention is to get the job done. They've just lost their way on how to do it. They don't wake up in the morning going, ha, 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 I can't wait to make Catherine cry today. That's not how it works. Why do people engage in workplace bullying? Well, I'll tell you, there are three reasons. The main one being they live in dire fear of being seen as incompetent. They would rather chew their own arm off than be seen as incompetent. So when I coach, kind of fascinating, we get really focused on the fight or flight model. That's, that's the crux of coaching. When you're yelling at your team, are you fighting or fleeing? Well, I'm fighting. And what's your team doing? They're all looking down with their arms folded, not talking. They're fleeing. So, of course, they're lacking empathy, otherwise they'd notice when they make people upset. And so they're defending themselves constantly through fighting. I'm going to give you a script that's going to change your life. When you talk to somebody engaging in bullying, you're going to say, we've had some complaints about perceptions of interactions with you. The perception is that you're abrasive. That has to change. And what are they going to say? Yes, I am too abrasive. You're right. No, that's not what they're going to say. They're going to say, no, -uh. don't you want to hear my side? They're just sensitive. Well, they're stupid. I'm holding them accountable for good work, right? So here's the, here's the script that's going to change your life. Don't get focused on facts, which is what HR does. Get focused on perceptions. I don't know. I am not in your department. The one fact I know is that several people have complained to me about their perceptions of you, and that perception has to change. Don't engage in a fact battle. It's just the one fact. The one fact I know is that this is the perception of you. So just to give you a, a case study, Mercedes is one of my star students. What I do when I coach is I interview 15 people. I collect all my interview notes. I move it all into themes like these. And I have about 20 pages of feedback that I read to the individual. And that is the moment that I can see they never intended to be that way. Mercedes cried like a baby and was like, I should quit, this is horrible, I wouldn't want to have me as a boss. She didn't know. She was just passionate, she just cared. After six months of coaching, re-interview everybody, and guess what? Mercedes made some serious change. So now she had 20 pages of really great feedback. So individuals who engage in bullying can change. The intention is not to harm. The intention is to get the job done. And I enjoy coaching tremendously. It's one of my favorite things. Um, so just keeping that in mind. We don't need to villainize them. We need to help them see. So with that, send me an email. I'll send you this matrix. I will also send you an ebook with some case studies about um, coaching, just to give you a, a more idea. Uh, if you happen to have LinkedIn Learning, I also have tons and tons of courses and lots of languages on LinkedIn Learning. And uh, keep your eyes out for navigating toxic work environments for dummies. Thank you very much. <laughs>